Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm speaking with Kaya Shaheen. Kaya is an associate professor in the Department of History at Indiana University in Bloomington. He is an expert on early modern Ottoman Empire with an interest in history writing, governance, religious identities, ceremonies, and rituals. He is the author of numerous books, including the most recent, Peerless Among Princes, The Life and Times of Sultan Suleiman. And that's what we talk about in this conversation. Uh, We start by giving an overview of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was uh, for many centuries. And um, we talk about how Suleiman was a critical leader at a critical point uh, in the Ottoman Empire. We talk about uh, his upbringing and how it was instrumental and how he was a leader and sort of his temperament. We talk about how succession worked for Suleiman, how he gained power and how he continued the spread of the empire early in his reign. We talk about the Grand Vizier and the importance of this role, major conflicts with Hungarians and Habsburgs of the time, uh, various executions and some of the reasons why he he you know, authorized them. And we talk about his reign overall, how it ended and his ongoing legacy. Um, as many people on the podcast will know, I'm quite fond of history. Uh, I really enjoy it, especially history that I don't know a whole lot about or didn't learn about, um, and trying to find interesting things, uh, about it. Obviously the Ottoman empire is, uh, tremendous. It's huge. Uh, there's obviously, uh, good moments, bad moments. Um, but it's important to understand in terms of global and world history and I came across this book, um, and it was it intrigued me because he was such an important figure for such an important empire, for such an important part of our anthropology and our history. And uh, it's really nice trying to kind of spotlight certain uh, people from various times and various places that we don't always hear about. And uh, this was a great book. I enjoyed reading it. It's very, very informative. And uh, Kaya was uh, absolutely wonderful, very, very lovely, brilliant. Um, wonderful to talk to. It was just a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I was I was so, so happy he was uh, able to, to come on. Um, as always, uh, you can find this conversation, all of the conversations over at my free Substack, convergingdialogues.substack.com. Give me a subscribe and follow and share with all your friends and people that you might uh, think this uh, podcast would be interesting for. Also on YouTube uh, as well, Converging Dialogues, same thing there. Subscribe, share, and um, I hope you enjoy this episode. So now I bring you Kaya Shaheen. I am here with Kaya Shaheen. Kaya, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very much looking forward to uh, talking with you. Thank you so much for your invitation. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, So I, I have this uh, newfound, I guess, uh, love for all things world history and different periods and different right. empires. And and Turkey definitely has a very rich uh, yeah. history, a very long history. Uh, I wish I had this this kind of uh, interest when I was an undergrad, taking all of my world history courses and stuff. I was like, let me just get this over with. So it's nice that I'm older now and I can digest this stuff. And You've written a fabulous book, which is called Thank The you. Life and Times of Sultan Suleiman, Peerless Among Princes. Uh, it's super fascinating. So before we get into it, uh, why don't you tell listeners uh, who you are, what your background's in, what you do, and uh, what you uh, currently think and write about. Sure. So uh, my name is Kaya Shahin. I am a professor of history at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, I'm in the history department, uh, but... I stopped being a scholar, although temporarily recently when I accepted a job as executive associate dean. So I work in the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies currently, which is also part of Indiana University. And it's interesting that you would talk about, uh, you know, world history. We kind of are trying to give a sort of, you know, more global, well anchored, but kind of more global education to our students. So I am a historian of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I went through the, you know, usual training, the languages, the history, a PhD program. Uh, But I am also very much interested in the connections of the Ottomans with the wider world. You know, Mm -hmm. what was the function? What was the place of the Ottoman Empire within a global environment in which we had these different empires 
expanding the global commerce, expanding uh, the exchange of ideas, goods, as well as germs were expanding. So I'm kind of looking at that critical period through an Ottoman lens, but remaining mindful of uh, other other similar empires or, you know, remaining mindful of political formations beyond the Ottomans, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, History has so many things to teach us and uh, so many things to understand accurately. And of course, if there's, you know, big empires um, and there's uh, all these big civilizations, it's important to know what they were up to and what they got right and what they got wrong. And, you know, just, there's a human thread here throughout all of it for our, our anthropology. So it's important. So, so I guess let's, let's start with this just for, for listeners that may not know, whatever, before we, we get kind of dumped into, uh, Sultan, uh, Suleiman's kind of time frame, uh, just kind of give us the like two minute snapshot overview of the Ottoman empire, when it starts, when it ends and why you decided to write about him and this particular aspect of the Ottoman empire. This is a wonderful question. So <laughs> The Ottoman Empire starts around 1300. Uh, basically, I mean, at the beginning, what we see is a small small group of raiders coming from a nomadic background, and they know how to ride horses and how to use weapons, and they basically create a... I mean, they are raiders and they are soldiers of fortune, but also in time, they establish a sort of political movement, and they eventually start creating these different structures of power. So what we see is a sort of procession from a small group of raiders and soldiers of fortune into a small principality and then into a kind of regional kingdom and into a sort of global empire uh, by the final decades of the 16th century. The Ottoman Empire, of course, goes much beyond the late 16th century. The official end of the empire is 1922, when the National Assembly uh, in in Ankara basically abolishes the Sultanate. That's the end of the Ottoman Empire. The the, the last Sultan uh, of the Ottoman dynasty, Mehmed Vahid Eddin VI, leaves uh, Istanbul. And so this is the uh, official end of the the Ottoman Empire. So uh, the Ottomans become a major global empire by the end of the 16th century. uh, And then they remain a major sort of political and economic player uh, in European, uh, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, Eurasian affairs, uh, pretty much, you know, to the end of the empire. Uh, as I am sure you know, for instance, they are one of the participants in World War I. So all the way into that, you know, major global conflict, they continue playing this, uh, these these different uh, roles in, in regional as well as global history. Yeah, so I think it's important to know. I mean, where where Turkey is is uh, is on the globe is pretty central at yeah. different parts in global history, especially when you think about uh, a place like you know, formerly known as Constantinople, which we now know yeah. as Istanbul, as a big you know port city, trade, so many things, um, <clears throat> a lot of cultural things. But how how did how did this empire maintain? For 600 plus years is a long time yeah. it's a, into the modern era. I mean, that's a long time. Yeah, it is a long time. And I was thinking about other empires as well uh, when you were asking your question. The, the Austrian Habsburgs in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, if we say that, you know, they are established in the area in the 1520s or 1530s, they also survive for a very, very long time in an environment in which we have multiple ethnicities, religions, languages, different modes of production, different geographical conditions and this and that. But I think at the end of the day, this is what an empire does. I mean, an empire is a structure of power, obviously, when we think of it. But it is also a a form of pragmatism. I mean, and I don't want to cheapen it, but I I want to say something like a principled pragmatism. So in my mind, an empire is always a mixture of, you know, the exercise of power and the exercise of pragmatism. I mean, at times you have a very powerful political center, you know, that collects taxes and, you know, commands uh, armies. And then at other times, you have a sort of decentralization whereby 
you know, uh, important and powerful figures in the countryside, in the provinces become kind of more powerful. And then there's a period in which, you know, you, you start seeing a sort of recentralization whereby the periphery loses power. These kinds of, this sort of ebb and flow is constantly observed uh, throughout Ottoman history, as well as throughout the histories of the other empires. I think, I mean, an empire is basically a structure of power, obviously. It's also a sort of like structure, political and cultural structure for the incorporation and management of diversity. Unlike the nation state, an empire basically allows the existence and coexistence of diversity mm. and usually kind of prevents diversity from becoming a source for any kind of contention or any kind of violence. So an empire is much better positioned through its pragmatism, uh, you know, towards the management of diversity. So in that regard, it is very much different than the nation state. And I think that that sort of pragmatism uh, is core to the survival of these kinds of large land-based empires. The Byzantine Empire is a, another example. The Byzantine Empire goes, you know, from whatever, 333, 450 to 1453, mm -hmm. right? 1100 years yeah. and again i mean it is it is a very similar geography like the ottomans you know mm -hmm. parts of the middle east anatolia the balkans uh you know the eastern mediterranean naval presence in the eastern mediterranean so the byzantines basically follow a a similar model there is i mean obviously there are moments when you know the imperial center tries to impose like in the Byzantine case, uh, they try to um, impose their own version of Christianity. In the Ottoman case, you know, uh, there's a certain time in Ottoman history whereby, you know, the Ottoman uh, political center wants to impose Sunni Islam onto the non-Sunni Muslims. But in general, basically, uh, an empire is a mechanism for managing difference, and they are fairly successful at that, more successful than nation states, I would say. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very, very nice way in which you describe it. So, so tell us about. So, obviously, there's a deep, long, rich history here. So, you, you, your, your book is about Suleiman, right? He, he's, yeah. he's the main, he's the main actor here. He's the main figure here. Give us. We'll get into all the details of things, but guess, give us the, the abstract, right? Give us, give us the, the thumbnail version of what made him such an important figure for the Ottoman Empire. And where he stands, in, in, I guess, in global history as we understand it. So you can talk about just briefly, just an overview of things he did, or or the big, big pieces that kind of give him his, you know, yeah. claim to fame, if you will. So first of all, I would say that Suleiman is a very lucky person, in the sense that his father wages a fairly difficult succession struggle. And he survives against all odds, thus making it possible for himself as well as for his son Suleiman to succeed to the Ottoman throne. But Suleiman is also lucky in the sense that, you know, he's healthy enough and again, fortunate enough to remain on the throne for uh, 46 years. I think that longevity is important because obviously it gives, it gave him a lot of opportunity for creating his legacy, for documenting his reign. If he had died younger, or if he didn't have these kinds of opportunities, financial, but as well as you know, having a long life uh, for leaving behind an image, I don't think we will be talking about him to this extent. But he also has you know, a number of uh, assets and a number of achievements. Among them, I mean, obviously, you know, He's someone with a very thorough education. He receives this, you know, uh, classical or uh, Renaissance, whatever you call it, style of education, which is languages, rhetorical sciences, history, poetry, but also physical exercise, you know, hunting, using weapons and stuff like that. So he's a well-educated person and, you know, he's very much interested in literature, history. He's a very accomplished poet. So this is another way uh, for him to kind of leave, leave behind a name uh, as an accomplished, you know, person of literature. Mm -hmm. uh, he also lives at a time, I would say, in and, you know, talking about the impact of the environment uh, on individual lives. And this is obviously something that he cannot control. He lives in an environment in which uh, structural issues like declining temperatures or droughts or increasing population pressures, these kinds of things 
uh, at least in the first uh, several decades of his reign. He, he, he so in, in, he basically you know reigns uh, at a time when the natural environment and the demography of the empire and this and that is kind of you know conducive to a fairly smooth management of uh, natural resources and the empire's resources. So again, in that regard, you know you can call him very fortunate. I'm emphasizing these things in order to kind of to not to focus too much on his you know personal achievements and stuff like that because in a biography the balance i mean a biography is, it should be a balancing game you know i mean we can overemphasize the context but we can also overemphasize the individual and i kind of want to make sure that we don't we don't overemphasize the individual so those are the structural things but the individual also has a couple of qualities uh first of all he's someone with a vision and actually, he's someone with different kinds of vision. Uh, he is very much aware that like, he's in a position from which he can argue for specific notions of uh, sovereignty, rulership. Mm. Uh, he, in his communiques and in his you know, uh, view of himself, justice, he emphasizes justice very much. For a time in his youth, he emphasizes sort of you know universal leadership, almost a messianic leadership, uh, and he claims to be able to bring East and West Islam and Christianity together. Mm-hmm. Towards the middle of his life, he repositions himself as the leader of the Sunni Muslim community, and again, I mean, he basically emerges as a major institution builder, legislation, but also charitable works, infrastructure works. So he is someone with who is able to kind of place himself in the midst of these large narratives and define and redefine himself accordingly and also successfully convey that message to the members of the elite, but also to, you know, uh, members of the Ottoman population at large. He's very big on ceremonialism, on performances, parades, celebrations, these kinds of things. So he's able to convey these different visions, these different images to large numbers of people. So in that regard, I mean, I would say that he's, he's, he's a very talented person, like a kind of thinker and promoter, which we, you, we do not see necessarily in all of these uh, royal figures throughout history. Mm. Yeah, I think that there's a, it seems in reading in reading the book is, is that there was a uh, concentrated effort to be very invested in establishing or, or building off of uh, tradition and to have things yeah. last after him as to promote the growth of the empire and yeah. understanding and having a careful consideration of how symbols and visuals and tradition exactly. and 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 um you know kind of the the you know the arts and 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 documenting things all of that has uh value uh, for yeah. for, for yeah. extending yeah. the the memory of them <clears throat> yeah. yeah i mean while writing the biography uh the notion of time, I mean, obviously, you know, time as we express it in our everyday lives, but also the passage of time as a human being, these kinds of things really, uh, you know, preoccupied me much more than they used to. Uh, this is something I said somewhere else. Now, now as, as I myself became middle-aged, uh, I was able, I think, to better connect to the mind of him, of the middle-aged Suleiman, mm. as you see him, you know, mm. reviewing his life in his mind, kind of trying to leave behind a legacy, reflecting on time, on the meaning of time, reflecting on his past achievements, reflecting on history, that sort of thing. Again, I mean, I tried not to psychologize him too much, and I tried not to, because simply, you know, we don't have those kinds of uh, documents in our hands. And, you know, I wanted to kind of keep the distinction of history from literature uh, mm-hmm. as much as it is possible as a, as, a, as a professional historian. But at the same time, you know, uh, there were also moments in which, you know, I felt close to him as a human being, you know, mm-hmm. reflecting on time. Mm. on the passage of time, on the meaning of time, on how one spends their time, you know, f- wasting time, you know, f- making good use of time, that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, that's again, something that comes very powerfully 
uh, through the you know documents and testimonies of his reign and from from his actions as well. So he was very self conscious mm. uh, in that regard as well. You know mm. about where his life came from, where it was going, that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's something to that that uh, yeah. is very very important. So he's uh, he's he grow born grown up grows up in uh, Trabzon, which is yeah, in uh, yeah. if I remember correctly, it's on the border of modern day Syria and Turkey, right? Is that, is that, is uh, no, the other way. Uh, the other side. Excuse me. It's it's on the uh, south. It's on the southeast uh, coast of the Black Sea, so it's oh. close to the border of Turkey with the Republic of Georgia today. Ah, uh-huh. okay, yes, yes, so it's I was kind of right across from the Crimea, and then you go mm-hmm. further east. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, so so, can you kind of just just briefly how, uh, you know, he was born just at the at the you know kind of raised in the 15th century, right? 15th yeah. century, right? And and then uh, he, 1494 or 95. Yeah, yeah. So so towards the end, and there's a lot of things going on. What you know, the Ottoman Empire had been around, I guess, for 200 years at this point. Yeah. His grandfather, his father were pretty big figures. But what was that like, especially with the whole divide between Muslims and non-Muslims? Um, yeah. What was what was it like for him? I guess coming up all the way to him being um, uh, uh, placed in uh, uh, Kaffa is the is the region. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. So when Suleiman is born, uh, his father is district governor in Trabzon. Uh, the Ottomans divided their realm into these district governorships and uh you know provincial governorships the provincial governorate being you know f- having a bunch of these district governorships under it and Suleiman's father was uh he was the son of the ruling sultan and again this was ottoman practice to send the princes out uh around puberty mm-hmm. to serve as district governors in different parts of the empire this served a couple of purposes. This, in a place like Trabzon, which had been in Ottoman hands slightly more than thirty years by the time Suleiman born, and by the time his father was appointed there, you know, Trabzon had been Ottoman for roughly twenty years or so. So one way was to kind of you know help incorporate these newly conquered places in the Ottoman Empire, you know, by having a prince serve there. Mm-hmm. Another use of that was to give the prince. The opportunity to receive a kind of hands-on education, you know, by becoming an administrator very early on, finding out, you know, the intricacies of Ottoman government, you know, coming of age, you know, developing political skills, military skills, all that sort of stuff. So Suleiman's father was district governor. So in that regard, obviously, you know, he had an elite childhood. But the demographic composition of the town and its placement, I mean, that's interesting. Uh, Trabzon was a somewhat isolated part of the Ottoman lands uh, in the late 15th century. Uh, Number one, it basically bordered uh, these, uh, you know, different small principalities or local entities in the Caucasus uh, further east. It's, it's, I mean, the, the city of Trabzon also is situated on the other side of the Pontic Mountains on a fairly narrow strip between the sea and the Pontic Mountains. Even though it was a commercial center, it also, you know, it had a challenging ecological environment. You know, uh, there were periods of famine, there were, you know, uh, contagious diseases and this and that. So uh, he basically lived in a small town uh, as a member of the elite, and yet, you know, uh, in an in an environment that had to be, you know, constantly uh, and carefully managed. As for the non-Muslims, so Trabzon, uh, when it was uh, conquered by the Ottomans, was the center of this Byzantine offshoot, and Trabzon was one of the last remaining, you know, Byzantine or Greek Orthodox strongholds uh, in Anatolia and the Balkans. Uh, so the population was made up of Orthodox Christians almost exclusively. There were also some Catholics living in there, but you know there were no Muslims before the Ottoman takeover. Mm-hmm. So the Ottoman takeover led to the uh, you know to the transfer of a number of Muslims. Some of them settlers, some of them people like preachers, uh, you know, uh, religious figures. Uh, Others, you know, Ottoman officials, soldiers, and military people. But regardless, uh, as Suleiman grew up in Trabzon, the overwhelming majority of the population was made up of non-Muslims. 
Um, Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Christians, Armenian Christians, and smaller communities of Venetians. Now, this was not a huge surprise demographically speaking, you know, alongside, you know, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean or the Black Sea coast. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of, you know, communities that you would encounter anywhere. But uh, in Suleiman's case, nevertheless, this means that he did grow up in a cosmopolitan environment. He lived with his family in the inner fortress of Trabzon. Uh, and he lived in an environment that was basically visually dominated by the remnants of this old uh, Byzantine empire. You know, stone carvings, inscriptions, old buildings, and all that sort of stuff. So while we cannot necessarily, you know, argue that, you know, he would have developed, let's say, a tolerant view of other cultures or anything, we we also have to emphasize that he did grow up in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-linguistic environment. And this was basically uh, his view of the world. Mm -hmm. Again, talking about the contrast between empire and nation state, between a sort of imperial pragmatism versus a nation state style, you know, single nation, single people kind of approach. Uh, Suleiman basically grew up, grew up in a very cosmopolitan uh, environment uh, mm -hmm. in Trabzon. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's important to note, I guess, in his development. And, you know, of course, you don't want to kind of look at things kind of uh, retroactively. But, you know, I wonder how much of that impact has on all the other things he did as as he reigned. So he becomes uh, the district governor of, of Kaffa. And then there's the kind of unpredictable succession that happens between him and his dad. They reign together, right? His, his dad becomes the sultan, and then he's reigning as district governor. So just talk about that and then how he became the sultan yeah. uh, and how that let happened. me correct you a little bit uh suleiman's father fights against suleiman's grandfather ah okay so <laughs> what happens is uh suleiman's father is but he he has uh a number of brothers uh in the year 1509, 1510, when these succession struggles are starting, uh, Suleiman's father has uh, four surviving brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, thinking about, yeah, four. Uh, and so all of these uh, brothers, uh, the sons of a reigning sultan, have the right to succeed to the Ottoman throne. But only one person can succeed to the Ottoman throne as a result of which, you know, succession has to take the form of a war among the princes and the losing princes, as well as their sons and their grandsons, will be exterminated. Mm. Quite Darwinian. Uh, but I mean, this was one, one of the ways in which uh, the Ottomans were able to hold on to the, to the lands under their control by introducing this principle that even though, according to the old, you know, nomadic Turkic Mongolian tradition of giving each prince an equal right on ruling the domain, only one person at the end of the day could mm -hmm. rule the domain and to, to, the, to the disadvantage of everyone else. Mm -hmm. So Suleiman's father realizes that, you know, he's in an isolated period, as, sorry, area as the district governor of a small town. Some of his brothers have more revenue. They are located in more central places in the Ottoman lands. And also at least one of them uh, is favored by the Sultan and the members of the ruling class as the sort of next uh, Sultan, which means a death sentence for Suleiman and Suleiman's father. So mm -hmm. Suleiman's father basically rebels against this eventuality while the ruling sultan is alive. Usually this battle among the princes starts as the sultan dies. But Suleiman's father basically, you know, takes the initiative. Mm -hmm. He rebels. He fights against his own father. He loses a battle, but he escapes. And then, you know, through a series of fairly complicated events and fairly unpredictable events, he ends up as sultan in 1512. Uh, and then shortly after becoming sultan, he has Suleiman's father, Selim, has his own father, Bayezid, uh, poisoned. So, and then he uh, organizes a major campaign against his surviving brothers. By that time, he has two surviving brothers, 
uh, and then he also exterminates them, some members of their families. So by early 1513, uh, Suleiman and Selim basically remain as the only, you know, two uh, male members of the uh, Ottoman dynasty, and you know, Suleiman uh, basically becomes the heir apparent uh, to the throne. Uh, he serves as governor in Kaffa while his father wages the succession struggle because it's Ottoman practice. And his father also sends him to Kaffa because he uses Kaffa as a, as a center of operations. But after coming to the throne, uh, his father relocates Suleiman to Western Anatolia to another district governorship in a much less isolated, much more central area with more resources as well. So 1512, so roughly 1509, 1510 to 1512, uh, 1513, Suleiman's father wages this sort of succession struggle. He's successful, and then he has Suleiman relocated uh, to a better position. And then uh, from 1512, 13 to 1520, Suleiman basically trains as a sort of mature prince. He is also, you know, in his late teens, early 20s during this period, you know, he establishes a large household for himself. He starts having children. Uh, he basically, he has his own, you know, uh, form of government uh, in this Western Anatolia. I mean, fairly small and regional, but still, he basically establishes a microcosm of the Sultan's household in, in, in Constantinople. And he waits for his turn, basically. And then in 1520, that turn comes. Yeah. So, so how, where is, where does he, where does he get in 1520 where he's able to, to, uh, to become the, the, the Sultan and how much I get, you can talk about that, but I guess how much do you think, uh, a lot of this preparation work really helped him in the early part of his reign, especially when he starts to deal yeah. with Syria yeah. and Hungary. How, how exactly. Much? So he receives news in September, 1520 that, you know, his father died. A messenger is sent to him in Western Anatolia. And he rushes on to Constantinople. And, you know, uh, he reaches Constantinople in I think, three days. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, he, is, he becomes sultan the next day. There's a major submission ceremony. You know, members of the Ottoman elite come and, you know, they kiss his hand or they kiss the hem of his robe. Uh, so he becomes sultan uh, very quickly. In the next couple of years, as you said, on the one hand, I mean, he's obviously helped mm -hmm. by this background knowledge that he has in Ottoman administrative and political matters. He's not a child. Yeah. Uh, he, is, he is 24 or 25 years old when he comes to the throne, you know, uh, a fairly mature age uh, in the standards of the period. Uh but at the same time, he has a problem. I mean, even though he has a thorough training in Ottoman administrative life, uh, he is seen as a prince without much experience in terms of warfare. Warf since warfare, waging war, is one of the major preoccupations and activities of the ruler of the time, Suleiman is basically seen as somewhat inexperienced because he never leads any armies or he do, he doesn't figure in any military ventures before coming to the throne. So his image problem also extend to this. Uh, his father is this sort of like very sort of overwhelming, larger than life, overbearing, and at times, you know, uh, violent in terms of having a violent temper. His father is this really, you know, uh, sort of, as I was saying, I mean, kind of overwhelming uh, figure. And he also defeats not one, but two major enemies of the Ottomans. He doubles the territory of the Ottoman Empire uh, in the scope of, you know, uh, you know, from 1513 uh, to, you know, 1517, basically, yeah, within, within the scope of uh, three and a half, four years, uh, he leads armies against, you know, these uh, powerful rivals. And he basically, you know, extends the scope of the Ottoman Empire. So Suleiman basically feels he's a bit, you know, uh, pressured by the legacy of the father, by mm -hmm. the perception of him as inexperienced. So he starts doing a couple of things. He starts creating an image of himself as a just ruler. You see it in the first 
documents that are prepared under his reign, these letters of accession that are sent to different rulers. Uh, he also obviously benefits uh, from the members of the Ottoman administration that are left behind by his father. So he's savvy enough to develop an image for himself while benefiting from the expertise of these, you know, this old group of officials. So thanks to their support, thanks to the support of people that Suleiman inherits from his father, he's able to manage this major rebellion in Syria. He's also able to organize two major campaigns. Uh, you know, he captures Belgrade uh, from the Hungarians, and he also captures Rhodes from the Knights Hospitaller. And then after gathering, you know, a sort of critical amount of power, he starts reshaping the Ottoman, the upper levels of the Ottoman administration. He has a number of these officials he inherited from his father dismissed, and he starts replacing them uh, with his own people. And the most prominent among them is, uh, you know, the chief of the privy chamber, a man called Ibrahim, whom Suleiman promotes in unprecedented fashion from palace and domestic service to the Grand Vizirate, which is the largest sort of executive office in the Ottoman Empire. So by 1524, uh, by the early months of uh, 1524, uh, the sort of first stage of Suleiman's rule is done. He is able to build an image as a just sultan as well as a skilled conqueror after his initial uh, military campaigns. And then he's also able to successfully push aside the officials he inherited from his father and kind of replaces them with his own men. So that's kind of how he manages the first couple of years, the first several years on the throne. Yeah, yeah. it was interesting about the Hungarian and Syrian conflicts. I guess I want to ask about this Grand Vizier as, as, yeah, as, as, yeah. and how they, they make the law code and the preamble and this big document and wanting this global mission of universal rule under yeah. the Ottoman Empire. Talk about their dynamic and, and what yeah. they were up to. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yes. And this is this is the perfect kind of moment to, to address that. So <laughs> Suleiman, uh, as, as we just talked about, kind of consolidates his rule uh, during the first several years of uh, his reign. He he controls uh, the Ottoman military political elite, and then he promotes he promotes a close friend and servant to the Grand Vizirate. And after that, he basically starts kind of formulating and you know publicizing his own vision. Uh, the, the new Grand Vizier. Uh, we know that you know he was very close to Suleiman during his years as district governor in Western Anatolia, as well as you know uh, the first years of Suleiman on the throne. So the Sultan and the Grand Vizier, and you know they are not the only ones doing coming up with, the, with, with this kind of vision at this uh, particular point in history. You know the Habsburgs. Uh, you know, Charles V, uh, Suleiman's contemporary, has similar views. All of those messianic and apocalyptic prophecies are running roughshod across Europe and the Middle East, I would say across Eurasia. So it's an environment in which these kinds of ideas of universal rule, universal justice, universal peace are fairly popular. Suleiman's ambition, and I guess, you know, his, also his success is to inscribe himself in these kinds of narratives and come up with a coherent narrative whereby, you know, as a, as a just ruler, as a militarily successful ruler, as a wealthy ruler, with the help of this perfect servant, the Grand Vizier, he claims that, you know, he will fight uh, to usher in a sort of new age in which East and West and Islam and Christianity will be gathered under the same mantle and that, you know, a new age of, you know, peace and harmony will be ushered in. Again, I mean, this is not something that's very strange. Uh, similar utopias, you know, exist throughout human history, I would say, but particularly starting with the late medieval period. So another interesting thing about Suleiman is the fact that he places himself uh, in these historical narratives and there are indications that he did believe in them and his following campaigns in Europe mm -hmm. uh, against the Habsburgs, 
uh, for instance, are clearly, I mean, you know, a military campaign is meant to keep the military class together, gather, uh, you know, resources, all of that. I'm not disregarding that, but uh, when you look at Suleiman's following campaigns uh, in Central Europe, next to their military objectives, they almost always have this sort of, you know, overarching uh, sort of ideological vision. Mm. Uh, so he tries to implement that. And as a result of, as a result, he basically enters into this intense uh, competition with the Habsburgs. Yeah. So I want to ask about that. So obviously there's, he's, he's against the Hungarians again in 26 and then the Habsburgs in 32. Was this because these were kind of the the big uh, or the other uh, kind of entities or empires in the region, and 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 knocking them out or or subsuming them would kind of solidify that, and almost that he had to do that before he could move east and and start doing campaigns uh, uh, in a different part of the world. Did he have to kind of just get what was around him first, or how did this? What was the motivation, I guess, for this? So one motivation for Suleiman's campaigns in Europe was, and you find it in the uh, sources of the time, uh, because Suleiman's father had fought against other Muslim uh, sultanates and other Muslim powers, it becomes a matter of, again, image building for Suleiman to fight against the so-called enemies of Islam or the infidels and that sort of thing. Uh, Beyond the beyond that sort of propagandistic function, the Hungarians and the Ottomans, I mean, they are major rivals uh, already, you know, starting in the first decades of the 15th century. And before the Ottomans take over, uh, before the Ottomans defeat the Hungarians and before Hungary becomes partitioned uh, between the Ottomans and the Habsburgs, uh, Hungary is the major regional power in kind of around Central and Eastern Europe. So, and since these uh, these kinds of kingdoms of or empires basically uh, have this almost inbuilt, you know, necessity for warfare, they expand through warfare. Uh, they control trade routes through warfare, all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, the Ottoman-Hungarian rivalry uh, is in a way inescapable. And as you said, I mean, like you know, we have these uh, expanding kingdoms and empires. And their clash cannot be prevented in the sense that, I mean, the sort of more modern, I mean, notions of peace, ceasefire, all of those kinds of things uh, obviously exist in the 16th century. But at the same time, I mean, and again, as a historian, we talk, we oftentimes talk about the difference of the past uh, compared with, uh, you know, what we see today. Violence military violence, warfare, is such an inescapable and constant aspect of the everyday lives of these upper classes that it is almost inconceivable that the Ottomans and the, the Hungarians would not clash against one another or the, the Habsburgs and the Ottomans mm. later on. I mean, this is, this is how you compete for prestige, for resources. You know, mm. you go to the battlefield. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting how that was such a, a common part of life, uh, and, it, yeah. and it, it really carried on through for, for many, many, many centuries. I, I, I want to ask about some of these executions. So you, you kind of teed it up for us, I guess, with his dad and his dad yeah. killed kill a lot of his, fa his family to, to get there. But yeah, he ends up executing this uh, this grand vizier, the, the Ibrahim, and yeah. then he also executes his eldest son. I mean, what what was he up to with with doing these uh, executions with people close to him? Yeah. and these are these were very difficult uh, mm -hmm. decisions for him too. It's it's very obvious that these came at a huge uh, personal cost to him, as well as you know uh, a huge uh, cost to his reputation. In the case of the Grand Vizier Ibrahim, uh, he's executed in fifteen thirty six, and he's basically spending time together with the sultan in the palace during the night. And he's the only person who is allowed to sleep, you know, in the same quarters as, as Suleiman. And he's, he's there. I, I don't think he suspected what was coming to him. And, you know, he's basically executed uh, at night and then his corpse is disposed of. Why 
why would Suleiman have, you know, one of his closest friends, if not his closest friend, executed? I mean, there is a lot of confusion in the sources of the time. I mean, so much so that we can only speculate. But there are a couple of things. I mean, first of all, uh, as you know from the book, despite all his wealth and power, Ibrahim remained a slave of Suleiman to the end of his life as mm-hmm. a as someone who was uh, taken in by slave merchants as a Christian and someone who was later converted to Islam and who entered Ottoman service, uh, basically in Ottoman practice, uh, while they shouldn't, strictly according to the Sharia, uh, people from that background were made to keep their, their slave status. Mm-hmm. So Despite everything that he did, Ibrahim basically was a slave of the Sultan. Uh, Another potential reason, so we talked about the ambitious vision that Ibrahim and Suleiman came up with Mm -hmm. in 1524, 1525, and they fought major campaigns to implement it. They fought against the Hungarians together and then the Habsburgs and then in the east against the Safavids of Iran. Mm -hmm. And in a way, none of these campaigns resulted in the sort of overwhelming victory that they were hoping for. And I suspect that Ibrahim became the face of that failure, the Mm -hmm. face, the, the, the representative of that vision that the two men had formulated. Yet another reason, Ibrahim, I mean, by all accounts, again, he was a very witty, very intelligent uh, person, a great conversationalist, and Suleiman was always attracted towards people like that. I mean, that's another thing about him that comes across centuries, that he liked to to be in the presence of interesting people, well-educated people. And Ibrahim basically, you know, uh, fit the bill. But he, he he was also, you know, again, very self-conscious uh, about his status, a big self-promoter and someone who was into, you know, ostentatious behavior, conspicuous consumption. He would show up in public wearing very expensive jewelry, you know, extremely, uh, you know, uh, expensive clothes. Uh, so the ostentatious behavior, again, may have contributed to sort of his declining, not declining reputation, but to a decline in Suleiman's uh, sympathy. Ibrahim basically becomes almost a competing figure next to the sultan through this kind of behavior. And again, since there can only be one sultan, he, he pays the ultimate price. Mm. Suleiman's son, Mustafa, Kind of a similar story, even though there are significant differences. Uh, so the first son Suleiman has executed uh, in uh, 1553 is his eldest survivor, surviving son at that time. Uh, now, Suleiman has other surviving children at that time. He has uh, three sons and a daughter surviving in 1553, uh, in addition to Mustafa. But Mustafa is from a different mother. The, fo- the, the other four children the, 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 uh, are from Suleiman's long, lifelong relationship with Hurem. And Mustafa is the son of a concubine from the time, you know, from before the time Suleiman meets Hurem, and they, they become an item, basically, which is another interesting thing to do. Again, I mean, Ottoman sultans would have intercourse with concubines and they would have multiple children from multiple, multiple women. Uh, but, you know, Suleiman kind of defies that practice uh, after he meets uh, Hurem. So Mustafa is the eldest son. 1553, Suleiman is around, Suleiman is, is in his late 50s. He is sick with gout. Uh, you know, he is basically seen as kind of getting close to stepping down. Mm. So His eldest son, Mustafa, is increasingly seen as the most viable heir to the throne by a number of different people in Ottoman society. We also have indications that Mustafa also sees himself as the best candidate to the throne. We have a letter that he writes to another Ottoman governor in which, you know, he talks about himself in such a way that, you know, you clearly see this is a guy who is getting ready, you know, 
uh, to to step up, basically, you know, mm-hmm. to uh, to come to the throne. So Mustafa poses an existential threat and a sort of competition to, to both Suleiman and his other surviving children. Uh, so Suleiman's grand vizier at the time, who is also his son-in-law, uh, basically cooks up an accusation of treason. Uh, and Prince Mustafa is executed on the suspicion of rebellion against his father. Uh, but I mean, it's so it's similar to Ibrahim's execution in the sense that, you know, if you try to become an alternative source of power in that kind of society, you know, it's a very dangerous act in itself. But also uh, Mustafa basically, you know, kind of becomes the first victim of this uh, strange uh, succession practice of the Ottomans, you know, whereby princes fight it out among themselves. Uh, and another one of Suleiman's sons basically also becomes victim to that because in 1558 he rebels uh, because he wants to come to the throne and then he has to escape into Iran where he spends a number of years and then he's executed in Iran uh, in 1562. So Suleiman has two of his sons executed uh in the you know in the last uh decade and a half of his life mm. yeah, it's this is quite a quite quite the story i mean especially yeah. on the beginning and at the end very <laughs> shakespearean yes it does it's very very, very shakespearean <laughs> greek tragedy shakespearean yeah yeah everything. i guess <clears throat> the what is the you know as he, as he gets you know he, he eventually you know dies and there's a successor and and the ottoman empire obviously continues as we said in the beginning I guess the, the last big question I have here is is what you know writing this book and and obviously you know doing this research and stuff is just, what is the legacy of of Suleiman and how do we accurately understand him as a person and as a as a as a sultan Yeah that's a great way to finish uh I'm going to answer your second question first I think as in the case of any other person or any historical figure we have to under, we can understand him best if we focus on his achievements as well as failures, on his positive aspects as well as on his weaknesses and on his on his failings. I, so we have to kind of adopt a holistic view about him and also to look at his life, you know, from beginning to end rather than only the high points of that. This is particularly important because Suleiman himself was very conscious about his own legacy. So he left behind a number of markers to make sure that you know his life would be remembered the way he wanted. He had this uh, illustrated, versified history of his uh, reign written uh, in the 1540s and 1550s. He left behind a lot of charitable works and this and that. And when you look at the when you look at the history, uh, that versified, illustrated history called the Book of Suleiman, uh, you clearly see how he wanted to be remembered. You know, like it's an accomplished statesman, a hunter. Uh, you know, uh, he he. It, the book talks about his military accomplishments about how the entire world, you know, bowed in front of Suleiman's glory and all of those kinds of things. And when you look at his architectural legacy, you see an extremely thoughtful, charitable person catering to all the needs of the community, building soup kitchens, bathhouses, hospitals, and all of this sort of stuff. So the the, the sort of official narrative is very strong, and that's that's a major caution for us to kind of uh, you know, uh, we should be defining those kinds of official narratives. And uh, as I was saying, I mean, try to focus on the failures as well as as well as the achievements uh, themselves. Beyond that, though, I mean, why Suleiman is important? Uh, is that what you were asking? Or yeah, why is important for the Ottoman Empire, and and what is his kind of enduring why legacy? Yeah, why should we care about it? <laughs> I think Suleiman, together with similar figures from the time, I mean, Charles V, I always think about the two, uh, you know, uh, pretty much at the same time, or uh, people like Francis I uh, in France. So these are people, I think, who started building 
the first kind of modern bureaucratic structures and economic relations. I mean, they they ruled at a time of major transformations in world history. I would look at the 16th century as really sort of the turning point uh, between middle the Middle Ages and the modern period. I mean, it is a major time of transition. Uh, figures like Suleiman, as well as Charles V, they were able to navigate the tremendous challenges of the time. You know, uh, they were open to experiment with new ideas about religious identity, about political identity. Uh, they introduced new bureaucratic structures, new governmental institutions that made it easier for these governments uh, to collect taxes, to purchase weapons. They also contributed to the emergence of a kind of diplomatic relationship that did not necessarily exist before, like a kind of diplomacy as obviously a political conversation, but also as a sort of intercultural dialogue. Uh, again, goes you know to back to the 16th century in my mind. So this was an important time in world history, and some of these figures basically in a way, rose to the challenge and tried to, you know, uh, survive, but also transform themselves, transform their surroundings, establish things. So these are institution builders in that regard. So I think this is the biggest legacy of figures like, uh, again, Suleiman, Henry VIII, and Charles V, or Shah Thomas in Iran, uh, figures like Babur and Akbar in Mughal India, uh they they lived in a, in a in a moment of transitions and they they very much contributed uh to to the transformation of older structures and kind of they 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 really helped usher in this 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 new age which in my mind as i was saying is the beginning of uh modernity as we know of it today uh you could say that today we are getting increasingly away from the kind of world that, you know, people like, you know, Suleiman and Charles V ushered in with digitization, with a new kind of globalization, with a new form of identity politics, for instance, we may be kind of getting away from that and entering a new kind of historical period. Uh, but still, I mean, these figures do remain relevant as, you know, some of the founding fathers of the past 500 years of human history. Yeah, I like how you 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 put it in context, which you which you also do in the book, which is which is great. The book is called "The Life and Times of Sultan Suleiman, Peerless Among Princes." Uh, where can people find this, and where can uh, people find yourself? Uh, they can find the book on Amazon.com. Uh, it's published by Oxford University Press. Uh, Readers should feel free to send me an email uh, if they Google my name uh, and Indiana, uh, I will come up. I am the only person with a name like mine in the entire state of Indiana. <laughs> they can get my email from the website that's going to pop up and send me their questions. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Uh, Kai, it's, it's, it's such a, uh, a fun conversation. I mean, I, it's so 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 much fun to to learn about important figures, and I like how you 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 definitely make it contextual and and super relevant. And the book is very readable. I mean, again, someone that's uh, not not as well um, uh, informed about these things, I I was able to read it very easily, and it was great. So I, I really appreciate and your time. That was my intention. I mean, I tried to provide you know, uh, I, you cannot assume that you know everybody would know about Ottoman history. So I am very glad to hear that you think I did a good job in that regard because that was exactly my intention. So I really appreciate your feedback and these wonderful questions that you came up with, which which made this a very pleasant conversation for me. Of course. Well, you know, I, I, I have you, know, you to thank for, for explaining it so well. So, so big thanks. Thank you so much.